Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brendan Bopel. I'm the program co uh, coordinator for Colorado College's State of the Rockies project. The Colorado River is the iconic river of the American West. The native peoples of the Southwest knew it as the center of the universe. Others have called it the Great American Nile, others a pipeline for the arid Southwest. For the 2011 to 2012 Colorado College State of the Rockies project, the Colorado River Basin has come to mean many things. During last summer, it meant the continuation of the project's tradition of student-faculty collaborative research. First, starting here on campus, investigating the basin's many issues, and then conducting research out in the field as we traveled throughout the basin, meeting with different stakeholders and witnessing the extensive infrastructure built for the diversion of water to municipalities, industry, and agriculture. This past fall, it meant a speaker series focusing on Colorado River Basin issues, ranging from the law of the river to the implications of a changing climate. From October to January, it meant a source to sea trip down the Colorado River, from the snowy headwaters of the Green River in Wyoming to the imperiled river delta in Mexico. Our two field researchers, Will Stauffer Norris and Zach Podmore, paddled some 1,700 miles down the length of the basin and reported from the field on the issues they encountered and the sites they saw. Oops. <laughs> this spring, the Rockies project involvement with the Colorado River continues. Tonight, we unveil our 2012 State of the Rockies report card. Within its pages, one can find a plethora of knowledge regarding various basin issues. After some introductory sections, a summary of the Rockies project source to sea journey brings a personal narrative to the life of the river. The section following on diversion and storage of the river's water discusses the many uses of the basin's water and the extensive infrastructure put in place to meet rising demands. After that, an investigation into the law of the river questions whether the legal framework around which the river and its water are managed is a rigid relic or a flexible foundation for the future. Next, an analysis of recreation in the basin takes into account the growing influence that skiers, rafters, anglers, and the like have on local economies and the role that recreation can play in the future management of the basin. A discussion of the basin's ecology and environment highlights the next section with a particular emphasis on the growing acknowledgement of the necessity of in-stream flows to protect fragile riparian ecosystems throughout the basin. An analysis of the basin's changing climate covers the implications of a warmer, drier world and an already stressed river system. The concluding section is a call to action. Our student researchers have laid down five separate actions to improve the management of, a, of the basin so that a healthy and viable river system might exist, exist for the next generation. From advocating for a new approach to water use and allocation, to building adaptability and flexibility into the system to address the volatility of future climate, these actions incorporate a year of the project's research and a poll of college-age students regarding their opinions on the basin's management. Taken together, they outline a change in the management of the river basin towards an age of conservation. Having followed the first two aspects of the Rockies Project motto, research, report, engage, this conference and tonight's events are meant to engage you, the basin stakeholders. And although we currently sit outside of the basin, the water we drink in, the ho in our homes and the food we put on our tables are all dependent upon a healthy Colorado River Basin. Thus, I put it to you that we should begin to see the river not as a pipeline for the arid southwest, but rather as the native peoples of the Colorado Plateau viewed it as the center of the universe. Because the issues of the Colorado River and its tributaries are not limited to the Southwest or even the Rocky Mountain region. Water drink in Los Angeles, lawns watered in Denver, vegetables eaten in the winter months in New York all necessitate a healthy Colorado River. Tonight we are very pleased to welcome two of Colorado College's distinguished alumni back to campus. But before we hear them speak, I'd like to show a quick video from some more recent CC graduates involving other officials in the Department of the Interior. This video was filmed in the imperiled Colorado River Delta and from the Morelos Dam on the U.S.-Mexico border.
I'm Will Stoffer Norris. And I'm Zach Posboy. And we just spent the last four months paddling the Colorado River from source to sea. So we're just uh, sitting here at the Morales Dam where the river pretty much effectively ends. It's this pretty uh, powerful image of one side of the dam you know, filled up with water and the other side there's just a trickle coming up. The river, the Colorado River is completely dry uh, from a little ways down from this dam here. And then in places where the groundwater is uh, uh, close enough to the surface, there's a few little remnants of the river. And then the, the Rio Hardy, which is basically a wastewater um, runoff stream, uh, joins the Colorado. And so there's a little bit of water in the riverbed. So there actually is a little bit of water where it meets the ocean. But you know, it was it was not much. It was actually too shallow for us to paddle through, so we ended up you know, slogging through knee-deep mud for hours and hours to reach the ocean. Kind of just come off of the river. Uh, what are some of your top takeaways that, that you've really learned on your experience? When we planned the trip, we didn't really know where the river ended up. We'd spent a lot of time in the wilderness sections of Utah um, and Colorado, kayaking and rafting, um, but. We'd heard that the river didn't reach the sea, but we didn't really realize what that meant until we came here and saw it. And it, it means that there's um, hundreds of thousands of acres that once had um, water flowing through, flowing through them, and all of that is, is dry now except for a select few parts, less than 10% of the original um, wetlands. And uh, you can really see the difference between you know, these places that have just even a little bit of water, and there's so many birds. And then there's these areas that we hiked through with just mile after mile after mile of tamarisk thickets, which is an invasive species. And that contrast is so striking that even that tiny amount of you know, agricultural wastewater basically uh, can make that big of a difference in restoring the delta. From your perspective, is the delta the, the most significant environmental issue that you saw on this journey? Absolutely. I think any water we can get down here is going to make a huge difference in terms of um, giving a wide variety of species habitat and um, really um, helping to bring the delta back to something um, closer to what it used to be. It's, it's definitely the low-hanging fruit on the Colorado in terms of making a big difference. And I mean, it's worth noting that 90% of the water in the river is diverted before it even hits Morales Dam here before it even goes into Mexico. So it's not like the problem starts here at the diversion um, of Morales Dam, you know. I mean, you guys know that, obviously. You know, w it was hard for us to picture what the Delta would be like before we came down here. Um, and so I'm sure it's hard for, for you all in Washington, D.C. To, to picture what it's like out in the Mexican desert. Um, but, you know, try and imagine what if the Potomac, somebody just completely diverted every bit of water in the Potomac and it was just cracked mud flats and filled it with invasive species. You know, how, how would that be as a place to go recreate in, paddle in, and walk around next to? Um, so if you can just imagine, you know, your local river completely dewatered, uh, you know, how, how would that have an impact in the local community? And that's exactly what's happening down here in the Delta. Well, that, that is a really good um, visual comparison. You guys are doing good work. And we appreciate the conversation. Thanks for taking the time. And um, we hope that this issue remains at the forefront of um, all the negotiations that are going on with Mexico right now. Welcome to the second session of our April 9 and 10 State of the Rockies Conference on the Colorado River Basin. This afternoon, Will and Zach had a longer slog through the river, and it's spectacular. I would encourage you to take a look at it. I want to thank both Will and Zach, as well as the student researchers, who have brought this single topic together in a very vivid way, and I would encourage you to look at the report card, which is available also in the lobby. I also want to put us uh, in a special thanks to Brendan Bopel, 
who is the program coordinator, and he makes everything work. So please join me in thanking him. We have two speakers tonight. We're very blessed to have both of them. They're both Colorado College graduates. And Dr. Marsha McNutt, who is the director of the USGS, will speak second. First will be Secretary Ken Salazar. And I want to first mention the title of his, top, his talk, and then I want to spend a little bit of time introducing him. The talk is Energy, Water, and Conservation in the West. And we're delighted to have Ken back on campus. He was a trustee at one point until we sent him off to Washington to solve more complex problems. And I, the reason I have a longer introduction is that I want our students to understand the threads that lead from Colorado College to what many of our graduates go on to do in a very distinguished manner. And Ken was born in 1955, grew up in the San Luis Valley, and attended high school in La Jara, graduated in 1973. He attended Colorado College and graduated in 1977 with a degree in political science. He then went on to receive his Juris Doctor at the University of Michigan Law School in 1981, and I would like you to keep track of these years. He later was honor, uh, honored with an honorary degree, Doctor of Laws from Colorado College, as well as the University of Denver. After graduating from law school, he started private practice and working in, imagine, water and environmental issues. And he worked with some of the top law firms in the West. In 1986, Ken Salazar became chief legal counsel for then Governor Roy Romer. And in 1990, Governor Romer appointed him to his cabinet as director of the Colorado Department of Natural Resources. And in that position, he crafted regulations for oil, mining, and gas uh, operations, worked on Colorado's interstate water compacts, and was the first chairman of Great Outdoors Colorado. Many of these are extremely successful programs that go on today. He went back to private practice briefly in 1994. In 1998, was elected as Attorney General and was re-elected to that position in 2002. In, 19, in 2004, Mr. Salazar declared his candidacy for the U.S. Senate, which was being vacated by Republican Senator Ben Nighthorse Campbell. And his campaign logo was fighting for Colorado's land, water, and people. And he's never stopped doing that. He served in the U.S. Senate starting in 2004. He took office on January 4, 2005. He was a member of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And he then resigned that position to go on January 20th, 2009, in order to become Secretary of the Interior. And I think many of you understand just how complex the Department of Interior is. It has the National Park Service, U.S. and Fish and Wildlife Service, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management, USGS, and Bureau of Reclamation, among others. And he has worked on a number of extremely important issues, continues to be a representative, I believe, of the soundest conservation perspectives that we could have in Washington. And yet he still has his roots in Colorado, and he returns often. I think the San Luis Valley is a very favorite place for him. So I'm pleased to announce tonight that Ken is our 2011-2012 Champion of the Rockies. And a little bit of history, in 2007-8, the project expanded what we did to add the Champion of the Rockies. And our first champion was Ted Turner. Our second champions were Ben and Etsy, ben, Ed and Betsy Marston, who reinvigorated High Country News. And then in April 2011, Terry Tempest Williams. And so we honor Secretary Salazar tonight for his service and if Ken, if you would come up, I'd like to present you with, if we could have the lights, please.
this is a picture of the San Luis Valley, and it should be very familiar to Ken. It was a cover photo done by Steve Weaver, used on the 2006 report card, I believe it was. And we're delighted that you are our champion of the ride. Yeah, well, he, he Cox is pretty good, you know. Uh, let me uh, first of all say that it's uh, an honor for me to be here at the Colorado College. And uh, to see so many of you, uh, many of you who were my friends when I was here at, uh, in school back in the 1970s, and many of you who have been my, my great mentors, my professors, and uh, who really have been the wind under the wings that I have had uh, in my life's uh, own journey. You know, uh, Jill uh, Tiffenthaler, I'm still trying to get her name right, uh, has visited me in the office and has told me about how important uh, Colorado College and the agenda is, and I'm a 100% supporter of Colorado College. Uh, my good friend, Dick Celeste, and uh, his wife, Jacqueline. Jacqueline is not here tonight. But I remember being on the Board of Trustees when we looked high and low all over this country to find the very best president we could to come and serve Colorado College. And he did a stellar job for CC. Dick, stand up. Let's give you a round of applause. There are many friends that I see tonight in the audience, from uh, Chuck Murphy to uh, Hank Worley to uh, Jack Pottle and so many others who have uh, been part of my life's journey. Uh, Alan Gilbert, and then a couple of Colorado College grads uh, who have, uh, uh, one works with me now, one has been a, a mentor of mine for a long time, uh, Stuart Bliss, 1962 graduate of Colorado College. Stuart, please stand. Why well, you know a little bit about this man, just because <laughs> I met with one of the students earlier today, and she was telling me she was majoring in political science, and I, I said to her, uh, well, uh, you know, maybe one of these days you'll be the first female president of the United States of America. Maybe it'll happen before she gets there. But I said, you need to have a good person to make sure that your campaigns are run right. Stuart Bliss has been the chairman of my campaigns for attorney general in 98, in 2002, and in 2004. And many of you who participated in those races know that most people didn't think that we could win, and yet we want all of them. And uh, I'm delighted and honored uh, that I have the opportunity and privilege that I have today. And Dr. Marsha McNutt, whom we will be hearing from soon, uh, truly is uh, the smartest uh, person, I think, uh, in the universe. And uh, you will know why when she gives you a description of uh, what she has been doing, uh, not only on the Colorado River system, but she does so many things all around the world. She just came back, actually, from Antarctica, uh, where she uh, spent uh, some time down in Antarctica uh, understanding how our planet uh, can be better understood through the science and knowledge of that very special place. So let me say, Walt, thank you for the honor. Uh, I'm going to spend about 15 minutes speaking about some general things, uh, including conservation and energy. And then after I finish, uh, we'll have a, an opportunity to hear from Marsha, and then she and I will come back up, and we'll take your questions, no matter how hard they are, no matter if they're Republican or Democrat or Independent or Tea Party or non-Tea Party, we're here to answer your questions. So uh, we, we will save some time for doing that. Let me first uh, start out by saying that it seems like it was only yesterday, uh, some 35 years ago, when I came here to Colorado College. Now, for most of you students who are here today, you probably came here before you actually enrolled in the school. Well, I did not. And I remember the day that I left uh, the ranch uh, down in the valley where my family has farmed now for almost 150 years. And I headed north. I got off the tractor and the baler and I got in 1973 Grumlin and I headed north. And the only thing that I remembered about Colorado College, I had applied and I had seen the pictures, but I had never been here. But there was a sign on I-25 that I had seen the year before when I was going to the state track meet and it said Colorado College, next right. So Dick, I said, if I can find that sign, I'll find the college and I can start my college journey. <laughs> so I came to Colorado Springs with full confidence and a little bit of trepidation and I found that sign and it said, Colorado College next right. So I get off and I go out on Uenta and I go east looking for Colorado College and 
Looks like a very big city to me. Very big city. So you got you to understand, I came from a place that didn't have electricity or telephone in those days. So this was really a big city. For me, Pueblo and Alamosa were kind of like, uh, you know, uh, probably like Denver today. And I always thought, I mean, when I saw Colorado Springs that day, I thought, well, this is kind of like New York City. It's so big. <laughs> anyway, I headed east on Uenta. And somewhere out there, 20 minutes later or so, 30 minutes later, <laughs> I decided, well, I don't think I have found the college yet, so I should be a smart Colorado College tiger, and I should go and inquire about where Colorado College is. <laughs> so I stopped at a gas station, so oh, yeah, yeah, I know where the college is, just come down here, go, go west, uh, you'll hang a right on Nevada, you go up this way, then you get another right, you take that right, and you'll be right there at the college. I say, okay, thank you very much, sir. So I get back on my car. and. I go down the exact directions and I drive into this place that had a sign that said, the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. <laughs> <laughs> so there very quickly I went in and talked to some administrator who was there and she said, uh, well, Colorado College is back there. So you get back on Nevada, you go south and you'll come across uh, Kosh Laputer and uh, Nevada and right there you'll find a place called Slocum Hall. And so that's where I lived in uh, my first year here at Colorado College, One West Locum Hall. And many years later, when I was on the board of trustees at Colorado College, we would meet in the new facility outside of Slocum Hall. And I would remember with fondness the great joy that Jack and Hank and uh, Jim and Bill and so many of my great friends and uh, faculty members here. So let me at the outset say, uh, you know, unlike Marsha McNutt, who made it through here in three years, and Stuart Bliss, who was, well, he's a Republican, I'm a Democrat, right? But he was the chairman of my campaign. He made it through here in two years, okay? The cardinal lesson that I want to leave to all of you students about your choices in life is make sure you surround yourself with people that are smarter than you, okay? <laughs> because if you do that, you'll be able to be successful, okay? So that was one of the tricks in the bag that I, I took from, from Colorado College. So thank you all for being a part of that journey. Let me uh, say a quick word about uh, the Department of Interior because I think uh, oftentimes uh, it is not a department that is uh, well understood by people around the country. Uh, when President Obama asked me to be his cabinet secretary, uh, I knew it was an important position and I knew it was seventh in line to the presidency of the United States. And I also knew that there was a misnomer about the Department of Interior because it was seen so much as being the Department of the West because we have huge land holdings uh, as the United States of America and places like Nevada where more than 80% of the land in Nevada is owned by the United States of America, all of you, the taxpayers, the citizens of this country, managed by the BLM. But I wanted to make sure that people really understood what the Department of Interior was. So shortly after I was uh, sworn in as Secretary of Interior, I went to the Statue of Liberty because I wanted to make sure that everybody in America understood that uh, the Department of Interior really is a Department of America. And it really is. It really is. When you think about the great privilege and blessing that I have to serve as the Secretary of Interior, I get to see America, the beautiful, from sea to shining sea and out into the oceans, and the decisions we make have a huge impact on our entire planet. So I can take you to the Everglades, a World Heritage Site in South Florida, where we're restoring the river of grass today to the Elwa River in Washington State and the Olympic National Park where we have the largest river restoration project underway in the world today. Or I can take you to places such as Denali National Park or to the Gulf of Mexico where we're involved in uh, developing about 30% of the oil and gas resources for the United States of America from the Gulf. Or I can take you to the Arctic where we're moving forward very cautiously looking at developing additional information on what the possibilities are in the Arctic. Or I can take you to Acadia and the north woods of Maine, where there are so many things that are happening in that part of the country, and yet where there is this uh, tough schism, frankly, between those who would value state rights and those who would be, on the other hand, uh, proposing a national park in the north woods of Maine and trying to work through some of those issues. But I believe, as I've often uh, have told the president, including on a very recent flight with him, that this is the best job that there is for any member of the cabinet because I get to enjoy all of these wonderful things. And I do believe that in my time as uh, Secretary of Interior in uh, the last three and a half years, we have made a difference in some very important ways. 
We've done a lot on energy, including oil and natural gas, yes, because that's important. But yes, we've also made a huge difference in terms of creating a renewable energy revolution that nobody ever thought could happen. We have permitted 29 solar and geothermal and wind projects uh, in America today that will be providing electricity to 3 million homes in the United States. If you go to the deserts of Nevada and California now, you will see sprouting from those deserts the largest commercial solar scale plants in the world. And they will provide clean, renewable energy uh, to our nation. And so I'm proud of what we've done on the energy front. I'm proud of the work we also have done in providing uh, education and services to Native Americans in this country, where the President and I vowed that we would make a new beginning in our relationship with Native Americans in the United States. And as a result of that, we have done a great deal, including for the first time you're going to have portable water in the Navajo Reservation in Arizona and New Mexico. And you'll have portable water in places like the Crow Reservation in Montana. And I could speak about how we have reduced violent crime in the most violent of reservations by a total of 36% in that three-year period. So I'm proud of the new chapter that we've opened up with respect to Native Americans. I'm also proud of the work that we've done in conservation. And I know when we look at uh, the push on the Colorado River and the Delta and the future of uh, the uh, border and recovering or area, which needs obviously a lot of work below the, uh, the U.S.-Mexico line, that there's a lot of work that we need to do in the conservation arena. And my strong belief is that uh, whenever we talk about energy and economic development, and people say that we have to choose between energy and economic development and conservation, that it is a false choice that they provide to us. I think that we can do both. And I think that we are seeing how we are doing it here in Colorado. You know, for me, when I was uh, executive director of the Department of Natural Resources here in Colorado, working with Stuart Bliss and uh, with uh, others in uh, this state, we put together the campaign called the Great Outdoors Colorado Initiative. It was a time when there was still some economic difficulty from that great recession of the mid-80s in Colorado. And so people would often ask me, why are you putting together this campaign for Great Outdoors Colorado? And I would tell them that I did not want Colorado to become another Florida or another California. That I did not want to see a state that was a nonstop city from the Wyoming border to Trinidad. That I wanted us to invest in river restoration kinds of projects like we have here in the Fountain Creek or in the South Platte River or in the Yampa River in the Northwest. And I believe that 20 years or so now that that program has been functioning, we have already seen an indelible mark here in Colorado. We know that Colorado Springs and Denver will never grow together again because hundreds of thousands of acres in Douglas County, right on the other side of the El Paso County line, are protected forever in conservation. That means that the beautiful vistas and the wildlife habitat that exists in those areas and a ranching way of life will be sustained for time immemorial into the future. And there's all sorts of projects, whether it's on the Yampa or in the San Luis Valley, where we're still working on similar initiatives uh, that I am very proud of. But I remember during that campaign that people would come up to me and they would say, why are you concerned about conservation and about these places? I would tell them, because it's about the quality of life. When we're out recruiting companies to come here to the state of Colorado, what brings them to our great state? What brings them to our great state is the fact that we have the quality of life here, that we have the beauty of the mountains. When I think about Colorado Springs and Pikes Peak and some of the ranching areas to the west of us here, I think that it is the beauty of this state and the conservation ethic that we've been able to develop in this state that has given us great promise also for good economics in the future. And so that's the same argument that I have used in Washington, D.C. as we worked on our America's Great Outdoors agenda. And I'm proud of the work that we've done. Some of you here know Will Shafroth, who uh, is, uh, was the executive director we hired to run Great Outdoors Colorado. He's leading our America's Great Outdoors agenda. And it's an agenda which the president has asked me to lead to create a 21st century conservation agenda for this country. 
And there are three legs to this tripod of this conservation agenda for the United States. One of them is about rivers. One of those legs is about rivers. So just like here on the Colorado River where there is so much complexity and so much difficulty, we believe that there are at least 200 major river projects in the United States of America where we will see very significant restoration efforts that are underway now and we'll continue to see them in the future. I've been proud that under that initiative we created a national water trail system under the authority vested in the Secretary of Interior. In the future, look for additional initiatives relative to a national blue way system that really does something which we've been able to do in a number of different places here in Colorado. I think about the South Platte River, which was such a wasteland for such a long time, where the Denver and the wastewater system for Denver would use that as a place to dump all of their junk. It was a time when people basically had their backs to the river. Today, when you go through Denver and what started out as a 10 and a half mile project, now is about a 70 mile project, people have turned their faces to the river and are embracing the river because of all the qualities that that river brings, both in terms of its uh, environmental restoration, as well as the economic development that you now see in places like the Central uh, Platte Valley and Denver. We're doing that in about 200 projects now around the United States of America. And the second tripod, or the second uh, leg of this tripod, has to do with uh, great urban parks in this 21st century. We've come, come a long ways from the time when uh, President uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was the wilderness warrior and the conservation president of our country. Because in those days, we had mostly a rural population. Today, most of our population, 80%, lives in the urban areas. And so we have to find ways of connecting up our urban people, our urban young people, also to the great outdoors. We do it in the rural communities as well. But that's why in New York City, working with Mayor Bloomberg, we are creating a new crown jewel of what will be the largest, great, the largest uh, urban campground and wildlife area in the United States of America. That's why working in St. Louis, uh, we are not just restoring the arch and the gateway to the west, but we're connecting up the city of St. Louis to the Mississippi River, the third largest river in our world. And that's why when we work there in St. Louis, we're connecting up the historic place of the Dred Scott Courthouse to the three million people who live in St. Louis. So urban parks are a big part of our initiative and we have one here in Denver uh, in the Rocky Mountain Greenway area where we are actually trying to connect up the two, three wildlife refuges in the Denver metropolitan area up to Rocky Mountain National Park, which is the birthplace of the Colorado River, by the way. So we are planning on, on, on doing urban parks all around this country. And then the third leg uh, are our national landscapes. If you think about the landscapes that are of national significance to us. There are many, uh, and we're working on them all around the country, country through landscape conservation cooperatives. And we have and are, have forged ahead with the landscape conservation cooperative on the Colorado River. So many of the challenges that you see here, many of the challenges that you will see Marsha describe will be about, uh, will be resolved through that kind of conservation cooperative. Now, as I look at that part of our America's Great Outdoors agenda and the conservation agenda and how I talk to the president about it. I describe it in ways that uh, I think uh, accomplish both economic goals uh, at the same time accomplish a conservation agenda. I won't take you through all of these places that I've worked on over the last three and a half years, but I'll describe just a few. One is in the Flint Hills of Kansas, where we have the last of the remaining of the tall grass prairies in North America. 1.1 million acres. Now you would think that the people who were putting that conservation area together may have been somebody from an environmental organization and the Nature Conservancy, and yes, they were, they were involved. But it was also the ranching community at the Flint Hills because they wanted to preserve their ranching way of life for the sixth and the seventh and the eighth generation. So today we have a program where the 1.1 million acres of the last of the remaining tall grass prairies in North America will be preserved. We're doing the same thing in the Dakota grasslands in North Dakota and South Dakota, where we have the prairie potholes region, where you have 50% of all the migratory birds, called the duck factory of the world. And we have a conservation program underway where we will preserve the Dakota grasslands forever. And in the Everglades in Florida, where just in the last month, 
I was down there with a group of ranchers and we created a conservation area at the headwaters of the Everglades, the Everglades National uh, Conservation Area. And we have those kinds of landscapes that we're working on here in the Rockies as well. In uh, the crown of the continent, if you think about Glacier National Park and Yellowstone and uh, what truly has got to be one of the most magnificent crown jewels of the entire earth. We will, in the next three years, complete the protection of the entire crown of the continent, not only in the United States, but across the border into Canada because of the binational conservation effort that we have underway. And it doesn't just end in the Rockies or in the east or the west. You can go down to Texas, down in the Big Bend National Park, where we have about a million and a half acres in Big Bend National Park, which I oversee. But on the other side, you have Mexico that has a three million acre national conservation area. When Franklin Roosevelt signed the bill that uh, created Big Bend National Park, he also said in his proclamation that that area would not be uh, completely protected until we were able to create a binational conservation area with Mexico. We are well on our way to getting that done. So I, I love the area of conservation because I think it is important for us to make sure that we are protecting our planet as we use our planet. I want to say a word about energy, because energy has been an issue which um, has occupied my time. It occupies your time. It has implications for the Colorado River. If you're filling up your tanks with gas today, uh, you probably feel the pain, just like most Americans feel the pain. It's something the President and I have been very concerned about, and something the President and I have worked on since day one. So when we started putting together our priorities uh, at the very beginning of the administration, one of the things that the President and I spoke about was the importance of having an all-of-the-above energy strategy. And so, yes, we recognize that uh, we cannot simply find the silver bullet that will take down gas prices. Nobody can. And during these political times and political years, there's a lot of rhetoric that essentially has uh, bumper, sticker, uh, bumper stickers that say we can drive down the price of energy if we drill everywhere in America. You remember the old mantra, drill, baby, drill. Well, all of you who are here, because you're smart, will remember and you've studied what happened in the past when we had these kinds of oil, uh, oil and gas uh, price hikes like the one that we're experiencing today. You'll remember Richard Nixon and the formation of OPEC and his standing in front of the people of the United States and saying, we must be energy independent. And you remember Jimmy Carter as President of the United States when he said we had to confront the challenge before us and we needed to move forward with energy independence with the moral imperative of war, with the moral imperative of war. And that was a time when I was in this school and I remember that we were importing 30% of our oil from foreign countries. When I went, to be the United States Senator for Colorado, we were importing around 60% of our oil from foreign countries. Well, today, as a result, in large part, by the work that this president and uh, private industry have done, we are now importing only 45% of our oil from foreign countries. That's down from where it was 60% a few years ago. Now, it's important for us for some very fundamental principles uh, for our country important for our national security because we don't want to have our foreign policy tied essentially to what's happening to the oil czars in different places around the world. It's important for our economic security because it fuels our economy and it fuels jobs. And it's important also for our environment because if we can find ways of powering our economy in cleaner ways, we'll be able to tackle some of the challenges that we face, including climate change. So all of the above energy strategy is not meant to be a political uh, adage that you just throw out uh, during a campaign season. It's something that we've been working on from day one. And so yes, we've had a robust effort on oil and gas. And yes, since the President became President of the United States, we are producing 13% more oil just off of the public lands of America. But we're not doing it everywhere. We don't believe that it's appropriate to drill for oil in the vicinity of Arches National Park in Utah, and so we've said no to people who want to develop there. We don't believe that it's appropriate to do development where it's going to affect riparian areas or wetlands or rivers, so we've said no, you cannot drill there. So we're being, as Bob Abbey, the director of the BLM, would say, smart from the start, and we're being successful at producing oil and gas. 
And we also know that oil and gas is not the total answer for what we have to do for the future energy plan of America. So under the President's leadership, we have moved forward with uh, renewable energy in a way that has never happened in the history of the United States. Today, I can tell you all, three years after we started the effort, we have doubled the amount of renewable energy in the United States of America. People who thought we were crazy in trying to catch the sun, we can tell them we've caught the sun. We're catching the sun and it's providing electrons to the grid. People who thought we couldn't do as much as we have been able to do with wind power across America, we are now powering hundreds of thousands of homes all over America through wind energy. And people who didn't know what the opportunities were with the earth and geothermal energy, we are capturing lots of geothermal energy in places like Nevada and California. So renewables is a big thing for us. Next, we also have recognized that there's other chapters of energy that we need to open up. And so under this president, uh, we also have uh, licensed the first nuclear generator in Georgia uh, in the last 30 years. Not without controversy, but with the newer technology that has been done, we believe that it can be done. Now, as I say those are all part of, our, of all of the above energy plan, and I do believe that we've been very successful in, in, in the implementation of those components of the plan, there's another component which is just as important, and that's efficiency. How do we use less? How do we get vehicles that can drive up to 55 miles to a gallon? Well, under the, the President's authority, uh, for the first time in history, we now have the fuel efficiency standards that not only have saved uh, the automakers of America, but also have brought within our grasp the reality that we're going to be able to drive much farther on a tank of gas just because of the high fuel efficiencies that our vehicles will get. So it's not only saved the automobile industry, it's also saving lots of oil here in America. Last year alone, and this is just a basic fact, last year alone we imported one million barrels of oil less a day. One million barrels of oil less a day into this country because of the implementation of that all of the above strategy, which includes energy efficiency. So I'm proud of the work that we have done. Now let me tie that in in two final comments, Walt, if I may hear, on uh, how this ties into uh, conservation and into water. First, many of you here will remember the formation of the Land and Water Conservation Fund back in the 1960s when Robert Kennedy and Stuart Udall sat in my office and put together a letter that went from uh, President Kennedy to the Congress. And in that letter, what uh, they suggested, what President Kennedy suggested, is that as we take from our earth, we should also put something back into conservation. And so he said, as we open up the Outer Continental Shelf for oil and gas development, which was opened up shortly after that, after that point, that we would take a part of those royalties and we would invest them in the conservation agenda for America. Well. What's happened is that it's been a broken promise because only about half of the amount of money that was supposed to be currently authorized at $900 million a year, only about half the money has found its way into conservation. The rest of it has never been appropriated by Congress, notwithstanding the fact that in my department alone, we generate about $11 billion a year just from royalties off of your public lands. So it seems to me that there's a nexus here in terms of development of energy on our public lands and how we invest in conservation. As we move forward with oil and gas development, we ought to be able to invest in conservation. As we move forward with renewable energy projects, we ought to be able to take those revenues and invest them in conservation. And I think that that is, I mean, the, the President has proposed it. Uh, we're working very hard in Congress to get some of that done, and I hope we do get to full funding of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Now, the last point uh, before I turn it over to Marsh on the Colorado River is this. Yeah, the Colorado River was uh, and has been uh, a highly litigated river over a very long period of time. And when those compacts were put together, they were put together not with the best of knowledge and not with the best of science. There were states that were negotiating among themselves and finally those, that compact came together among the states ratified by the United States uh, Congress, signed off by the President. But what they did is they missed the mark by some two million acre feet, okay? Because those who were 
forecasting how much water would be available from the Colorado River simply made a, a mistake. They thought there was a lot more water there than there actually was. And so much of what you have seen in terms of the conflict and the acrimony, much of which I have been involved in over the last 20 years, has been about the fact that the Colorado River is already a water short, year, water short river. That more water from that river has been allocated than what that river has today. And not only among the seven states, but also with Mexico, because we have a treaty with Mexico that requires us to deliver a certain amount of water to Mexico. So we're working on all of those issues. We're working on all those issues. We're working on it through water conservation, and we're working on it with a, a new agreement with Mexico that we hope to be able to announce soon. We're working on what we do with respect to the recovery efforts for the endangered species on the Colorado River. We're working on it in terms of protecting the water quality of the Grand Canyon, where I set aside under my authority a million acres from, uh, protected from uranium mining because we don't want the water quality on the Colorado River to be affected. So we're working on it from a whole host of fronts. But the one point that I want to leave you with here tonight is its nexus to something that is also a very politically hot issue. Your congressman here from Colorado Springs is proposing that we move full bore ahead with oil shale development in the West, that it is the Saudi Arabia and the panacea to all of America's energy needs. Well, he's not talking about shale gas in uh, the Bakken Formation in uh, North Dakota. What he's talking about is a shale, oil shale, in the western part of Colorado, where this state has most of the oil shale. And what it is, is taking essentially what they call kerogen from a rock and making oil out of it. Well, some of us have been around this uh, rodeo before and know what happened when that was tried multiple times, including in the 1980s, when we had the largest bust in uh, economic history of the Western Slope, because all of a sudden the companies found out that they couldn't develop it, because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to develop carriage and, and ultimately oil from oil shale. It takes a huge amount of energy. But the nexus here for the Colorado River and Walt, you and your 40 students who are smarter than the world need to make sure that we are letting the world know about this, is how much water, how much water would be required to develop those oil shale resources. Some estimates I've seen are over a million acre feet. Some estimates I've seen two million acre feet. Well, where would that water come from? Is there any water left in the Colorado River? Is there any water there to be allocated? What's going to be the consequence to the municipalities that you represent, Hank Worley, if all of a sudden we have a million more acre feet that are being consumed in oil shale development? What's going to be the consequence to ranchers and farmers who are so dependent on the water supply of the Colorado River? What's going to be the consequence to the 25 million Americans, 25 million Americans? who depend on the Colorado River for their water supply. So there is indeed a nexus between energy and the water supply of the Colorado River, energy in a larger sense, and water supply and water quality issues. And so we work to try to balance all of those issues. Let me finally just say that um, I am very optimistic that no matter how hard any of these problems are, including the energy problems of the United States, that with the great minds that we have in this country and the great minds that we have here in Colorado College, the 40 students who participated in this year's project, that we can solve any one of these problems. Thank you very much.
As I mentioned about Ken's introduction, I want to likewise spend a little bit of time talking about Dr. Marcia McNutt, who is now the director of the U.S. Geological Survey, the first woman director in the survey's 130-year history, and the nation's largest water earth. nation's largest water, earth, and biological science and civilian mapping agency. And for those of us in the West, we're quite used to USGS, at least some of your products. She pre previously served as president and chief executive officer of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And as a scientist, Dr. McNutt has participated in 15 major oceanographic e expeditions. She's published 50 peer-reviewed scientific articles. Her research has ranged from studies of ocean island vo volcanism to continental breakup in the western United States and to uplift of the Tibetan Plateau. She's a native of Minneapolis, and she graduated as class valedictorian in 1970. She then came to Colorado College and received her BA degree in physics, and Ken reminds us it was done in three years. She was Phi Beta Kappa, and she next served as, uh, was a National Science Foundation graduate fellow. She studied geophysics at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography and earned a PhD in Earth Sciences in 1978. She then spent three years, initially, with USGS in Menlo Park, California, and then joined the faculty of MIT in 1982, where she became the Griswold Professor of Geophysics. She has many honors, including serving as president of the American Geophysical Union, as a fellow of the American Geophysical uh, Union now, and Geological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and a number of honors, including the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And she holds honorary degrees from University of Minnesota, Colorado College, Monmouth University, and Colorado School of Mines. We're delighted that Marcia can be with us tonight to talk about science for sustainability in the Rocky Mountain West. Okay, thank you very much. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to be here tonight, and um, I'm going to uh, change tactic a little bit and um, talk a little bit how, of how USGS science can help inform some of these uh, very difficult decisions that Secretary Salazar talked about when it comes to water and water availability here in the Rocky Mountain West. And I want to begin my story tonight um, with this man, uh, Joseph Christmas Ives, who was a military officer, and he was the first American to ever visit the Grand Canyon. And when he arrived, he declared it the gates of hell. He was quite sure that his party would be the first and last a uh, party of whites to venture there as he saw little of value in the Colorado River. Uh, what a difference 150 years makes. The Colorado River today provides water to 25 million people and is used to irrigate 2.5 million acres of farmland that supports $3 billion worth of agriculture. Sometimes the Colorado River is referred to the hardest working river. It's the largest source of service water in a large and arid region. The Colorado River flows generate hydroelectricity. They support a large recreational um, industry and um, ecological habitat. They sustain cultural and historical values. Roughly 90% of the river flow for the Colorado River derived from snow melt in the upper basin, which are the states of Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. But most of the use of the Colorado River is in the lower basin, which is Arizona and uh, California and uh, Nevada. 
And so if there's a theme to my talk tonight, that theme is that changes in climate and land use in the upper basin affect water availability in the lower basin and sometimes in very subtle ways that aren't apparent to those, um, those who are affecting their land use in the upper basin, how they're going to be affecting that water availability in the lower basin. And um, the, the map in the lower left corner just shows precipitation for February uh, of 2012, showing how those lower basin states are uh, extremely arid and how dependent they are on the snowfall in the upper part of the basin. Now, John Wesley Powell, who was the second director of the US uh, GS and was the first American to navigate um, the Grand Canyon in uh, 1869, anticipated uh, problems in water management and uh, suggested actually that when the western states uh, were set up, that they should actually be set up along watersheds. And he um, suggested to uh, the US Congress that in dividing up the states, if they were divided up along watersheds, that would very much ease these management issues. Because um, then um, a watershed would, um, would entirely be within the purview of one state to manage the water within that state's boundaries. His plan was entirely ignored. Now, the issue that I want to talk to you about today in terms of climate change and land use and how that affects water availability is one of dust. And for those of you who were paying careful attention when Walt put up his State of the Rockies report card, if you were looking carefully on page 108 of that um, table of contents, you saw something called dust, the perfect storm for the 21st century. So I'm going to talk to you about what's the relationship between dust and what can we do to prevent that perfect storm for the 21st century. And um, this uh, histogram that you're seeing up here shows the difference between um, the amount of dust that's kicked up in blue if um, soils are undisturbed, that is, we haven't done anything to, um, to disturb their natural biocrusts. And biocrusts are a thin veneer of living organisms that naturally coat um, the soils of the Colorado Plateau versus the orange bars which show what happens if those biocrusts get disturbed, either because of climate change or land use change, like um, driving a vehicle across, which you see in this lower picture here. Um, and what you see on the fine right side is fine sand. And for fine sand, which doesn't develop a biocrust, it doesn't matter what you do. It's going to be dusty no matter what happens. But for all other kinds of Colorado Plateau um, soils, if they have their biocrust intact, it's not a dusty place. And so if we can protect those biocrusts, we can um, uh, prevent them from being um, dusty places. However, in recent times, the Colorado Plateau has become a very dusty place. Now, um, one of the reasons why um, we're seeing an increase of, of um, dust is because of climate change. And here's just one model showing uh, trends in annual uh, mean temperatures um, as projected to occur over the next uh, century, according to uh, a NOAA climate model. And what you can see is uh, in the lower 48, the Four Corners area is basically um, uh, the, um, uh, the 
bullseye for uh, climate warming. And um, it's uh, the place where we expect to see a lot of climate warming. So how is that going to affect these bio crusts? Well, um, the desert soil surface has these um, bio crusts, and these crusts, um, in many cases, are uh, very susceptible to climate warming. And this plot here shows the percent cover with these lichens, which are a common uh, form of the bio crust, as a function of the maximum temperature in the previous June. And what you can see is as the maximum temperature increases, the percent of the soil that is covered by the bio crust decreases. So you can see that um, back in 1996, there was one spike, but you can see the number of spikes has been increasing with 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, all being years in which there were spikes in temperature which caused the percent of cover to plummet to 2%, 4%, 6% of um, the uh, Colorado um, plateau um, areas that um, had these spikes in temperature being covered by their protective bio crusts. So clearly spikes in temperature are not conducive to maintaining the bio crusts. In addition, um, the native grasses of the Colorado plateau also have problems with these spikes of temperature. And this was just an experiment that was done by some USGS scientists in which they put lamps out to simulate um, global warming um, to see what would happen under uh, two degrees and four degree warming scenarios. And what they found was that the native grasses did not do well under two degrees and four degrees of climate warming. And it wasn't actually that the grasses themselves didn't like the warming, but it was because the bio crusts were lost. And the bio crusts do a lot of fixing of nitrogen, and these native grasses really need the nitrogen in order to survive. And once the bio crusts were lost, then the native grasses were lost. And one might think, well, so we lose the native grasses, maybe other grasses will move in that are okay, that, you know, other types of grasses that can survive with warmer temperatures. But the problem is the native grasses of the Colorado Plateau are very well adapted to the conditions of the Colorado Plateau because they actually um, do well under the dry conditions because they can mine water from the caliche layers that underlie a lot of the dry basins. And caliche is a thin layer of calcium carbonate that is under the thin soils. And the, the calcium carbonate, or the caliche, traps water and um, preserves it through droughts. And the native grasses are perennial grasses. They um, persist through uh, droughts um, and so they're, um, they don't have to come back every year. The um, native grasses are perennials. And because their roots reach down into the caliche layers, they can mine the water so that even during a drought year, the perennial grasses will be green. And uh, because they're drawing water out of that caliche layer, whereas the invasive grasses can't do that because their roots will not reach down into the caliche layer to mine that water. So this is a um, uniquely adapted um, function of our uh, perennial um, Colorado Plateau grasses, uh, which is important. And here's just a uh, landscape from um, Canyonlands National Park, Utah, which shows the dry invasive grass in the foreground and the green 
um, perennial grasses in the background because the perennial grasses have reached down into the caliche layers. They've pulled out the water so they can stay green through this drought, whereas the perennial grasses are dry, and that is also a forest fire uh, problem as well because um, they are dry and therefore lead to increased fire danger. So why does dust matter? Well, um, this shows a Southern Rockies uh, landscape showing the dust that falls under, um, that falls on the snowpack. And um, it's not just an esoteric observation um, that dust matters. It's um, got quantifiable uh, impacts because when the dust falls on the snow, the dark colored dust absorbs heat and increases the rate at which the underlying snowpack melts. More than 80% of the runoff from the upper Colorado comes from the melting of this high elevation snow. When the mountain snowpack um, serves as a large uh, reservoir, uh, releasing the water for humans and wildlife through the west during the spring and summer. The dust-covered snow melts 50 days earlier than non-dust-covered snow. 50 days earlier, that's almost two months earlier. And the impact of dust on snow has been studied by a consortium of universities and agencies and has been published in um, some very very high profile uh, journals. And um, the response is that the earlier snowpack leaves soils exposed longer to solar radiation, which increases um, the loss, um, uh, the soil water loss. It results in earlier plant germination. The increased water loss from evapotranspiration lowers the input into the Colorado River um, up to 7% annually. That earlier uh, runoff is problematic for water managers and commonly reduces um, our ability to store water. The earlier melt also changes the timing of maximum stream flows. You can see the difference between the dust um, which is the red and the clean water in blue, both in the timing and the amount of water. Um, and these um, uh, changes here with 5%, just a 5% less annual runoff, that's two times Las Vegas's annual allocation of water that you've just lost with that. That's 18 months worth of LA's annual use, and it's half of Mexico's um, allocation of water just because of the dust problem. So the question is, what can we do um, uh, to mitigate the effect of dust? Well, the first th thing we can do is remember I showed you that different kinds of dust have different amounts that they actually will erode, those histograms I showed you. Well, one thing we can do is we are mapping where those different kinds of dust are around the Colorado Plateau. This is just one map around Moab, Utah. And for example, if someone wants to have a um, outdoor recreation area for off-road um, vehicles uh, for um, people to play with their off-road vehicles, we would only want to put them in places where it's a low dust um, area. So by mapping the different kinds of dust, we can target the places where it's less likely to produce dust. Um, and uh, the other thing is, uh, uh, here's just dust blowing from a past fire in Utah, and we can um, understand um, the impacts of uh, fires and other things by uh, mapping out where these dust areas are. Um, other things like grazing, um, this just shows that um, um, dust input into the high elevation lakes were about 50 to 150 grams per square meter per year um, before um, there was much land use in the Colorado Plateau. Um, once um, large herds of stock were brought in, that increased by five to eight times. But because most of this land was federal land, um, the federal government was able to bring in something called the Taylor Grazing Act, 
which in, um, which in the 1920s to 1930s greatly reduced the size of herds. And you can see then in the 1920s to 1930s, the amount of dust then greatly plummeted due to this uh, policy of the federal government. Now, it sort of leveled off even though herds have further been reduced by the federal government, and it's because of other kinds of land use, um, such as recreation, uh, energy exploration, um, cars driving on dirt roads, and things like that. So uh, it's leveled off, not due to livestock, but to um, other uh, things that we probably can um, control, but um, need um, other policies. Um, and I should say that the Taylor Grazing Act was strongly supported by the ranching community. Now, for places where we still have uh, dust coming off the Colorado Plateau, there are places where um, the rangeland does need to be uh, rehabilitated. And there are some good examples um, uh, worldwide where rehabilitation for dusty areas has been very successful. This is um, an area in China where uh, fences were put up to stabilize movement of sand dunes. And um, this, these fences were able to stop sand from moving. And uh, within a few years' time, um, the rangeland came back. And uh, the fences then were made out of material that can biodegrade and then um, um, limited livestock grazing can be brought in again. This is an area in uh, Kenya where the soil was so fertile that all they needed to do was dig some trenches to stop water from just washing over the area. And the trenches then collected the water. And um, within one season, uh, the range came back again because the water didn't run off and um, the range was restored. And this was a scene that, because of overgrazing, um, the uh, land was denudated. And um, this uh, quickly came uh, back again. And this was just nine months later where the range came back. Now, I, I uh, started with a quote from Ives. I want to end with another quote from John Wesley Powell. Uh, John Wesley Powell, after um, being a USGS director and surveying uh, the water in the West, um, uh, proposed that um, there be some policies put in place for sustainable water use because he saw how arid the lands were and how much demand there was for irrigation. And uh, he predicted that unless his uh, plans for sustainable water use uh, were um, adopted, he predicted that all of the waters of all of the arid lands will eventually be taken from their natural channels and be totally consumed. Well, once again, John Wesley Powell's um, ideas were ignored. And you saw what has happened to the Colorado River. It no longer reaches the ocean. So uh, two men, Ives and Powell, both military men, both of the same generation. They both looked at the Colorado River. One man of limited vision saw nothing of value. One man of great vision saw something of great value. In fact, one could almost say that Powell, in looking at the Colorado River, saw Cortez's fabled El Dorado in the canyons of the Colorado River, where a ribbon of water breathes life into a parched land. The legacy of John Wesley Powell lives on in the scientists of the US Geological Survey, where they continue to use their science to help advise how science can help lead to good decisions for the future for the American West. Now, science cannot make decisions for you. They can only tell you, if you make certain decisions, what the future might be with those decisions. 
What you choose to do is up to you, the students of Colorado College. We've already seen how ignoring the science of John Wesley Powell has led. So I leave it to you to decide whether science will guide the future in deciding where the American West goes from here. Thank you all very much. So, uh, Walt, uh, with your permission, and I know it's uh, a little late, but uh, we got a few hours before we catch some uh, planes to Washington, so we'll take a few questions. <laughs> uh, who wants to go? Any question? Come down and use the microphones. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, I was wondering T why. Tell us your name first. And, uh, Tom Borelli, Manitou Springs, Colorado. Tom? Yeah. And okay. uh, my question is why don't we nationalize our energy? And if, if the answer is we can't, then why doesn't the administration do a better job of explaining that it's kind of out of our hands with the world energy situation? Thank you very much. I would just say that I think we have a, a system which is delivering a lot of energy. We have challenges and limitations. We have, we have, uh, we consume 20 percent of the world's oil, and yet we have just about 2% of the world's reserves. And so how we move forward with this uh, new energy frontier and make sure that we are much more efficient in how we use energy and how we develop alternative energies, including solar, geothermal, but also uh, biofuels, where we now have the first four biorefineries about ready to come online. Those are all ways in which we're going to move forward. I would also say that in places where you do have a nationalized energy policy, it hasn't worked well at all. Uh, if you think about Mexico right now, uh, Mexico uh, is very much shackled because of the fact that its nationalized industry has not been able to move forward and develop the uh, energy needs for, uh, for Mexico. Next question, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Will Denson. Uh, Phil? Will. Recent grad Will. I said grad of CC like you, a little bit okay. before you. Yeah. Uh, probably the same time as Marsha. Yeah, we're the same class. <laughs> <laughs> but my question really revolves around the Bureau of Land Management, the issue of um, oil and gas extraction, and the concept actually of hydrofracking, which is going on in the area in western Colorado and being also done out in the northeast as well. And what I'm asking is really is whether or not if you can be a moratorium put on the extractive processes of oil and gas extraction because of the impact that's been done upon the water and because there's limited availability of water. So my question really comes down to what can we be done to preserve what little we have of the water resource, especially in the West? I would first say that uh, the BLMs, uh, you know, in the last three years, 15,000 applications uh, to drill uh, have been processed. Permits have been issued. Oil and gas is doing well. And uh, that's across, uh, across the country. Now, there are legitimate concerns that people have raised with respect to hydraulic frac fracking or the stimulation of wells. And so we have a proposed rule that is under discussion that will ensure full dis disclosure of chemicals being injected into the underground. Secondly, assure well bore integrity because that's how you stop the contamination into, into the aquifers. And then thirdly, uh, making sure that there is monitoring with respect to what happens uh, on the flow back waters. Marsha uh, McNutt is uh, helping lead an effort between the Department of Energy and uh, USGS and EPA uh, to make sure that we understand hydraulic fracking and uh, the dangers that it, that it, that it has. I'm going to have Marsha just answer that one uh, also because she's a scientist. 
Yeah, one thing, Will, that we're encouraging is um, looking at whether some of the brackish water from some of the saline aquifers can be used for fracking rather than using fresh potable water so that there is to lessen the conflict between using uh, water that otherwise would be used for uh, humans and agriculture um, so that, and, and ecological purposes, and I think that would um, help with a lot of that conflict. Okay, uh, we have uh, one person over here, we have five people, three people lined up here. So let's just ask your question in about 30 seconds or a minute, and then uh, Marsha will wrap it up and I'll give a closing comment and try to respond to all your questions. So I'll give you, so there's the people who are standing get to ask their questions. So tell us your name and quickly what your question is. Uh, my name is Steve Trimble. I'm also a CC alum. And I wanted to ask your advice on how those of us who live in Utah, where I live, deal with the recent bill passed by the Utah State Legislature and signed by our governor demanding that all federal land, 30 million acres of federal land, be given back to the state of Utah to manage. Okay. Thank it's you. Thank you, Steve. We got it. Okay. <laughs> Let's come over here. Next. Um, oops. Sorry, my name is Liza Mitchell. I am also a Colorado College Liza. alum. And, um, it's Liza? Liza, yeah. Okay. Very interested, in, since I went to school here, in the difficulty in connecting science and policy. Um, so I'd like to hear, I guess, from each of you, um, as a politician, what's your perspective on the most effective way to hear science um, that's cutting edge and that can inform those kinds of decisions? And then as a scientist, what do you think is the most effective way to communicate that to policy that um, can be well received and, and um, sort of help bridge that gap. Okay, thank you, Liza. Let's come over here. Hi, my name is Robert Bishop. I'm a Colorado College student, and uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon, where water, we have different problems with water, mostly how to deal with it all. And I was wondering if you could comment on the role of uh, removing hydropower in the Northwest. Okay, hydropower. Thank you, Robert. Yes. My name is Sarah Porterfield. I'm a doctoral student in Boulder and a boater. I've been working on these rivers for about almost 10 years. Um, I have two questions, Ms. Nikaman. One is your thoughts on the preliminary approval of the, um, the Gasco project on Desolation Canyon, which would affect the wilderness pro proposals despite a pretty, what sounds like, viable option that would have uh, protected that wilderness. Um, and also, completely different question, what do you think is the viability of revising the Colorado River Compact? Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, over here. Hi, um, my name is Katie Doherty. I'm from Anchorage, Alaska, and I have a completely different question. Um, my question is about um, pursuing an energy independence agenda um, and how that will affect um, Alaska Native land holdings under ANCSA as Alaska Native landholders face increasing pressures from oil and gas companies um, to give up their lands, especially considering that the entirety of the Alaska con congressional delegation supports wide-scale development in the Arctic. Okay, thank you, Katie. Yes. John Stansfield from Larkspur, Colorado. Um, you gave us some, uh, I think, excellent examples, Mr. Secretary, of, of areas that in which the resources are so valuable or so fragile that um, cons conservation is perhaps the only path. And I would like to ask um, if the, um, not just the Arctic Coastal Plain of, uh, of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, um, but also the offshore areas of the, of the Bering, the Chukchi Sea, are not those type of areas. And if they should not be preserved with the the current shell lease being a perfect example of the opposite direction that we might go. Okay, thank you, John. Good question. Yes. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallegos from the San Luis Valley, from Manassa, just up the road from Los Cerritos, and we're uh, here to support you. You're probably you. related to me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. My mom was your second grade teacher. <laughs> It's a great teacher. We're here to support you and tell you how proud we are of you. And send you a big hug. Well, thank it's you me, very Bridget. Much. Bridget. <laughs> hey, Bridget. <laughs> hey. Your, your mom must have done something right in first grade when uh, she pulled my ears and did a few other things. <laughs> she, she, she put me on the right path. It's great to see you. 
thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Bridget. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Roy Dornbrook. I'm a freshman here Roy? at Colorado College. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, my question is, like, at the Department of the Interior, what factors do you use to determine like which wilderness areas to focus your conservation efforts on? Okay. And um, I'm also glad that you pronounced Nevada correctly. Uh, <laughs> if you think about it too long, you'll mispronounce it. Though. <laughs> Nevada is the actual pronunciation. But anyway, here's the deal. Uh, I'm going to have Marcia, why don't you take the, the science and policy connection question and anything else you want? And then I'll... Uh, I'll take that uh, one and give the rest to you. No. <laughs> and and give, give your closing comment. And then I'll try to run through these okay. other questions real fast and give a closing comment as well. Okay, um, just quickly on the science and policy. I think the best way to uh, create science that can inform policy is to make sure that it is absolutely policy neutral. Because um, once you produce science that has an agenda, science loses its credibility. Science has to be the facts, the straight facts, and nothing but the fact. Once you allow any personal bias to creep into the science, then science loses its credibility. As long as you stick to the facts, you lay it out there, give it to the policymakers, then they can do with it what they will. Let me. Uh let me try to take these uh, questions. So Steve, on the Utah bill signed by the governor, it's uh, obviously unconstitutional and wrong, and public lands bring uh, tremendous value. In fact, uh, I don't know where I was, uh, somewhere in the United States, and I was, uh, I think it was in California, uh, just Friday, and I, was, I, I turned on the television for just a few minutes, and I must have see, seen three commercials from the state of Utah advertising uh, canyon lands and arches and Zion and all the great places. And the one thing I like to remind the governor of Utah and others is that when you think about the outdoor recreation economy, it is a very significant part of our economy. We know that tourism and conservation in the United States create about 8 million jobs a year. Uh, I'm the co-chair of the President's uh, Tourism Council today and we know from uh, great studies that have been done by uh, independent groups that we can create another two to three million jobs just in tourism alone here in this country. And so that's, uh, if, so the, the Utah is simply wrong. Uh, they ultimately will, they ultimately will, uh, ha the law will be invalidated uh, in, in time. So they're just going in the wrong direction. Uh, Liza, I couldn't uh, say it, you know, Marcia says it so well in terms of the connection to science. And it relates a little bit to some of the answers that I'll give to uh, a couple of the other questions. Uh, Jumping down uh, very quickly, John, uh, the questions on uh, the Arctic Coastal Plain and the bearing of the Chukchi Seas and what we're doing up in Alaska, we have very limited knowledge, uh, frankly, of some of these places. Uh, we have very li limited knowledge, for example, in the Atlantic where there hasn't been any geological or seismic information developed really in uh, over 30 years. So it's just a total dearth of knowledge. And the Chukchi and, and the Beaufort Seas uh, in the Arctic what we do know is that uh, Russia and Norway, other countries are moving full speed ahead in the Arctic. We ourselves here in the United States have actually drilled uh, about 30 exploratory well wells in the Beaufort and in the Chukchi Seas. So even if we were to move forward, which the final decision has not been made on the Beaufort and the Chukchi Seas, uh, what would be done is that a series of exploration holes, probably three, four, five, would be uh, placed into those two seas. Now, uh, we will develop additional information. So we have, this will be the most watched effort in uh, exploration in the history of humankind. But the information that will be developed will be very helpful to the science tests to help us make decisions that will guide the long-term policies on whether or not there is development. There may not be development, uh, there may be development, but we need to make, have good information and good science to help us uh, guide, uh, guide us on those uh, decisions. On uh, the Arctic refuge in the coastal plain, uh, quite frankly, we do know enough about that and we do know enough about the resources there that, uh, in my view, uh, they will never be developed and we will not open up uh, the coastal plain for oil and gas development. It is too important of a conservation jewel for America 
and uh, in our view it is not an appropriate place for drilling. That's why we say we will support oil and gas development in the right places, but we won't support them in places where you shouldn't be doing oil and gas uh, development. On hydropower, Robert, uh, we will have a report out in several weeks uh, on uh, the Bureau of Reclamation's activities in hydropower, especially up in the northwestern part of the country. We do a lot already with hydropower. Uh, hydropower is a huge renewable. We're, now we're not talking, you know, I talk about the Elwa River where we're uh, taking on the largest river restoration effort in the, the history of the Northwest uh, and are doing it in other places as well. Uh, but we also know that what we call low head hydropower or you know, water that's flowing through pipes and other places has tremendous uh, potential for developing additional hydropower. And so there's a report that the Bureau of Reclamation will have on its facilities and how we might be able to develop additional hydropower from already existing uh, facilities and, 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 and pipelines. Um, Sarah on uh, uh, Gasco and the, the, their proposal and uh, the record of decision, we are still looking at it um, in terms of uh, whether or not there is a way in which uh, the wells that are proposed to be drilled in the Desolation Canyon area of uh, Utah, if, uh, those, if those can, uh, can be kept off from development. Now, I will use this as a story. You, you have seen some of these stories and you will see some in the next several weeks. We have been able to actually work with uh, some very important conservation organizations like the Southern uh, uh, Utah Wilderness Organizations uh, and the oil and gas industry to be able to develop best practices in how oil and gas uh, is developed. And so there are many wells that will be developed in Utah, but they're going to have the full support of the conservation community. And that's because they're being uh, developed in the right places with minimal disturbance for the surface and uh, providing the kind of conservation benefits also in mitigation that allow it to be a win-win, a win for uh, our energy needs and at the same time a, a win for conservation. And we have a couple of very significant examples that are in the offing in, in, the, in, the, in the state of Utah. Um, Sarah on the Colorado River Compact and it's, uh, uh, yeah, whether it's going to be opened up, I would say uh, the answer to that is uh, no. Uh, it will not be opened up. Uh, the uh, legacies that uh, have been created over now uh, more than 80 years on the Colorado River Compact are ones that are so embedded in state law and the law of the river as uh, it has become to be known through a series of U.S. Supreme Court decisions as well as uh, acts of Congress that it would be uh, frankly impossible to open it up. Now that doesn't mean that an effort that we started when Stuart Bliss was Chief of Staff to Roy Romer and I was Executive Director of the Department of Natural Resources will not help us resolve many of the issues that we face uh, on the Colorado River. Uh, including how we deal with water shortages, including how we deal with environmental needs for water supply, including how we uh, further the recreational opportunities on the Colorado River, including how we deal with uh, the areas uh, downstream of the border in the, in, in the Delta in Mexico. So we have a lot that we're working on that hopefully will help us address some of those issues. And when I think about the Colorado River as a whole, yes, it's a water short river, uh, yes, there were erroneous assumptions uh, made on bad science and bad information in uh, the 1920s. Uh, and yes, uh, the 9% projection that uh, we believe is going to happen in terms of declines because of climate change in the Colorado River, those will all happen. So there's less water and the challenges that Marcia described. But that's a water management challenge from my point of view. You know, how do we, how do we with uh, those challenges, uh, have the kind of water management capability on the Colorado River so we can address all of the, all the different demands. Um, on Alaska and uh, Alaska Natives and onshore, it's a huge issue for us. Uh, you know, I oversee the relationship that we have with uh, 566 tribes in the United States of America as well as all of the Alaska Natives and the villages in Alaska. And we're spending a lot of time uh, working with uh, the, the villages uh, from, from Barrow to Point Hope to other places to look at how we make sure that we also are providing opportunities for them with renewable energy, uh, but also through conservation and also making sure that their interests are, are, are protected. Uh, <clears throat> Roy, on uh, wilderness, uh, what I would say on wilderness is this. You know, 
we have a, a number of areas uh, which uh, the Congress could act on right now. And they're not just Democratic bills. Uh, we've identified a number of wilderness areas across the western part of the United States on BLM lands, which are appropriate for, in our view, permanent protection under the Wilderness Act. Uh, but in order for it to happen, you need Congress to pass the bills. And so we are urging Congress to accept the recommendations that we've made in the backcountry report that identifies many of these areas uh, throughout the western part of the United States. And those are crown jewels within our system. The Bureau of Land Management uh, through the National Landscape Conservation System, which we have created, which uh, the President signed into law in the Public Lands Act of 2009, shortly after coming into office, created 2 million acres of wilderness, 1,100 miles of wild and scenic rivers, a number of new units of the National Park, dozens of national uh, heritage areas, and a whole host of other things that probably will go down when one looks back at this time 10, 15 years from now as one of the most important conservation measures uh, passed in the last 30 to 40 years. In fact, Time Magazine on the week that the President signed that bill in early 2009 called it one of the 10 most important uh, uh, actions in the world uh, that had taken place in that week. So we're, we're building on that foundation uh, by looking at uh, additional areas for a wilderness designation around the country. Let me just uh, finish with this uh, last thought. Uh, maybe it's uh, how I get some of my inspiration. Uh, but yes, uh, from the valley and uh, Los Rincones and uh, Manassas where you look out to the east and you see the Sangre de Cristo mountain range and the crimson color of the sky as uh, the sun comes up every morning, or out to the west and the San Juan Mountains of that valley, or the rivers that traverse it, uh, the, the Rio Grande, and uh, places like the uh, Conejos River and other rivers, the San Antonio, which actually traverses our ranch. I get a lot of my inspiration from that place uh, because you have a special relationship to the land and the water, and you know that. Uh, as my parents and my grandparents and my great-grandparents knew, that our very way of life uh, depended on how we took care of our land and how we took care of our water. And so, yes, when I ran for Attorney General, as Walt said in his introduction, I did have the motto of fighting for Colorado's land, water, and people. That's why the Great Outdoors Colorado Trust Fund was, in fact, born. Uh, when I take on the issues of energy and conservation and fight for the land and water conservation fund and places like the Dakota grasslands and the Flint Hills and the Everglades, it's because I know there's that special relationship to our land and to our water. Uh, some people over the last three years have come to me and said, you know, it's a crazy idea. Are you guys worried about conservation? Well, I know many of you here are worried about conservation. That's why you're here. But I try to remind people that the conservation legacy of the United States of America is one that is born in the roots of some of the most difficult times and some of the greatest people who have ever led this country. If you think about Abraham Lincoln in the midst of the bloodiest war that America has ever been in, bloodier than World War II and World War I, over half a million Americans died on our own soil. And he was struggling, yes, at Fort Monroe with the Emancipation Proclamation and trying to figure out the meaning of that great war. And yet, during the midst of that war, he set aside the lands that became Yosemite National Park. And fast forward to another time of our great change in America through the Industrial Revolution and what was happening at the beginning of the last century. And you had a Republican president, Teddy Roosevelt, who goes on to become the wilderness warrior and who did so much to create the wildlife refuge system and the national park system as we know it today. He did it then, in the midst of those times. And then forward to another Roosevelt, a Democrat this time, Franklin Roosevelt. And it's a time of the Great Depression, a time when unemployment is much higher than it is now, a time when the Great Dust Bowl is uh, devastating uh, communities across Kansas and eastern Colorado. Those were difficult times. And yet, Franklin Roosevelt went on to become one of the greatest conservation presidents because he recognized that how man and nature lived together in balance was very important. And so there were more wildlife refuges created under FDR than under any other president. And he did it in those tough times. And then John Kennedy in the Bay of Pigs in the midst of 
the question on their plate was whether or not we're going to have another nuclear war. That was a question on his plate when he and Robert Kennedy and Stuart Udall suggested to the Congress of the United States that they pass the Land and Water Conservation Fund. And so when President Obama and I speak about conservation and we speak about the America's great outdoors and the conservation ethic of America, we look to those roots of ours for inspiration. And that's why no matter how hard the issues are, no matter how many people are out there wanting me to be fired because I'm not bringing gas prices down fast enough, <laughs> I know we're on the right side of history. Thank you all very, very much. Just a quick reminder, here tomorrow morning at 11.45 sharp, we'll start a session with Governor Hickenlooper. And he wants to talk to Colorado College students. At 4.30, Steve Trimble will be talking and showing some beautiful photographs and work he's done. Then tomorrow evening at 7.30, a panel of people from Colorado State Government and the Western Slope will talk about Colorado's role in the Colorado River Basin. So thank you for coming tonight.